Hey everyone! Welcome to How to Succeed on the First Day of Class, Part 2. In this video, I'm going to give you some classroom structures that should help you have success from the very first day of class. But first, here's a joke that will work in any season. Can February March? No, but April May. <laughs> Part 1 of this video talked about a lot of the problems that arise on the first day of class. This year marks my eighth time teaching a first lesson. And in the past, I have made each and every one of the mistakes mentioned in the last video. In this video, I hope to give you some ideas of how to avoid those mistakes and how to set yourself up for success from day one. One of the best parts of being a teacher is that every year you get to start fresh. You get a clean slate. No matter how bad last year was, this year can be better. No matter how troublesome last year's students were, these ones can be better. No matter how much you struggled as a teacher, this year you can improve. You can always wash off the stink of a bad year by starting off fresh. And even if last year was great, you can make it better. The key to doing this is starting before you begin. The day before. When the students show up, it's too late to be proactive. The day before school begins, you've got to stand at the front of your classroom and look around. Before you even begin to worry about students, you first need to address your classroom. How big is the room? Now, space can either be your friend by giving you elbow room, or it can be your enemy by running your legs off. The first feature of the classroom that you must take responsibility for structuring in order to facilitate learning is space. The single biggest variable that governs the likelihood of students goofing off in your class is their physical distance from you. Proximity is the name of the game. So you've got to ask yourself these two questions. Where will you place the furniture? And can you get around easily? Because teachers who make classroom discipline look easy, move. They produce proximity through mobility. They work the crowd because they know that either you work the crowd or the crowd works you. The biggest obstacle to mobility is the furniture. You need walkways, nice, broad walkways, so that you can move among the students easily. Room arrangement is the art of producing walkways within the normally crowded conditions of the classroom. The optimal room arrangement allows you to get from any student to any other student in the fewest steps. One of our first jobs, even before we begin to worry about students, is to take responsibility for where the furniture goes. This will play an important role in your structuring of the classroom. Personally, I advocate for the double E formation. Once you've got your classroom beautifully set up, the next issue you have to deal with is desk creep. Now, what do you think will happen to your lovely room arrangement when 30 students occupy those desks? Students are full of energy and they move. They twist and turn and squirm and scoot and their desks move with them. Desk creep doesn't really seem like a big deal, but a desk can block a walkway by creeping less than a foot, and that impedes your ability to efficiently and quickly move about the classroom to prevent problems and help students. To contain desk creep, you'll need visual markers to show the students where the furniture goes. Furniture must be straightened up during each lesson transition, so you might do this three, four, five times during one lesson period. If you don't, your walkways will disappear. When you make use of clear visual markers, you can say during a lesson transition, okay, and after you've handed in your papers and sharpened your pencils, put your desks back on their marks before you take your seats. One of the cheapest visual markers is a tape dot. A tape dot is simply a small piece of masking tape that you tear off of the end of the roll and stick on the floor. It's no bigger than the end of your finger. 
Two dots where the front legs of a desk touch the floor locates the desk. Now I know what you're thinking. On the day before students show up, you're going to be placing dots all over the floor after you've arranged the furniture. But rest assured that this is the last time that you will ever need to do it. When the tape dots have to be replaced you know, due to normal wear and tear, you'll have the students do it. It will be one of their regular classroom chores. Now that you know where your furniture should be, do you know where you will be? Where do you stand at the beginning of the class period? Let me tell you where I stand. In the doorway. In the hall, students laugh and joke and flirt as they pass from class to class. This is normal behavior for the hallway. The classroom, in contrast, is a work environment. Students would love to bring their social environment from the hall into the classroom. They would love to spend the first part of the class period finishing their conversations. And they will, unless you clearly structure a change in behavior. You've got to do everything you can to define the doorway into your classroom as a threshold between two different worlds. Clearly separate the social world from the world of schoolwork. And you can only define a work environment through work. So stand in the doorway, greet the students warmly, and above all else, give them a job to get on with. Whatever work you choose to give your students is bell work. Bell work, as the name implies, is the school work that students are doing when the bell rings. It is always the first task of the class period. Bell work will become part of your classroom routine. When you describe bell work to your students on the first day of school, instruct them never to ask you whether there is bell work today. There is bell work every day. It will always be posted on the board and it will always be posted in the same place. Tell the students as you greet them in the hallway, as soon as you reach your seat, look at the board for today's bell work and get started. As you can see, bell work is a bit of a misnomer because many students enter the class minutes before the bell rings. So say to the students, if you want to talk and socialize, stay out in the hall. That is what holes are for. When you're ready to work, come on in. On average, bell work consumes the first five minutes of the class period. Structuring work at the beginning of the class period eliminates a serious problem in classroom management. That problem is settling in. A typical class period is not on task until five to seven minutes after the bell rings. Teachers take roll and students talk, sharpen pencils and listen to announcements over the PA as they amble toward their seat. This daily ritual is called settling in. Settling in is so ingrained in the daily life of the classroom that few teachers regard it as a problem. It's just a normal way of starting class. But it is a problem. A big problem. If, for example, a class period lasts 50 minutes and you take five minutes for settling in each day, you thereby consume one-tenth of your total instruction time. Settling in is not just a problem for the first period of the day or for homeroom teachers or classroom teachers. I'm a subject teacher and I'm a traveling teacher, which means I move from classroom to classroom throughout the day. And I usually need a few minutes at the beginning of class to get set up, to make sure that the computer is working, to open up my PowerPoints, to organize my papers. That's what bell work is for. Sometimes we all need a meaningful learning experience that does not require our active teaching. Sometimes we all need bell work. Now you've got to be thinking to yourself, what do I do for bell work? First, keep it simple. Second, make sure that it serves a purpose in getting the day's instruction started. Use it as a warm-up activity. It probably incorporates review that you would have done anyway after settling in. But review is just one of the many possibilities for bell work. Some teachers use journal writing or silent reading. Others put word games or mind benders on the board. I mean, the sky's the limit as long as it makes sense in terms of your classroom. 
in terms of checking the work, my advice is this. Do not saddle yourself with an extra stack of papers to grade. Some teachers flip through bell work quickly and put an X in a column of the grade book for those students who gave it a decent try. Other teachers farm out this job to students who are on the clerical work committee this week. Some teachers collect the papers with due seriousness, glance them over, and then drop them into the recycling bin. After all, the purpose is to start the kids thinking, not to assess performance. This icebreaker is my go-to bell work on the first day of school. Because on the first day of school, one of the most important questions in students' minds is, who are they? If you think the students all know each other, think again. Here's what I do. Hand out a blank seating chart and ask the students to fill in the first and last names of everyone in the class. You might be surprised, but rarely have I had a number of correct papers that exceeded 25%. Students do better in class both academically and socially when they are comfortable, relaxed, and at home. They do not do so well in an impersonal environment. I recommend that you spend the entirety of your first lesson getting to know students and helping students get to know one another. Many teachers feel that it is all important to set the tone of the class by getting right into a media assignment during the first class period. Now, While well-intentioned, this objective is not aligned with the students' needs. Think of yourself suddenly thrown together with a group of your peers. Some you know, and some you don't. Plus a few good friends that you haven't seen in months. Some social settling in is definitely necessary. If you invest time and energy in producing comfort, you signal to students that you care about them as people. If you did not invest, you signal that they are nothing but warm bodies occupying chairs in your class. Try to remember that since the objective of breaking the ice is social, have some fun with it. Anything that gets the students to interact with each other and laugh is golden. Bell work is important, and the students can always tell what is important to you just by watching. Things that are important are worth your time and worth your effort. Things that are not important are either put off or dealt with in passing. By the time that this bell work is complete, students will have a well-formed impression of who you are and what goes on in your classroom. And finally, a question. What do you want to get out of this year? Sometimes teachers are too worried about planning a lesson, scheduling a day, making it through a week, getting to the end of the semester, that they forget that there's a bigger picture an end goal in mind. What's yours? What do you want out of this year? What do you want your students to get out of this year? Having an answer to this question gives you an end to aim towards. Your activities and your lessons and the things that you have students do in class all work towards answering this question, meeting your year-long objective. I want my students to become better speakers. So everything that I do works towards that goal. And in doing so, not only am I able to plan better, I'm able to motivate myself. And my final piece of advice is that if you found this video and you're already in the middle of a semester when you learn about the power of proactive relationship building, tomorrow can always be the first day of school. Jump in and get started.